In this report, responding to your tips, your comments, your critical feedback, your inner executive producer. I don't know how I feel specifically about having intercourse with some of you, but let's have a crack anyway. I'm John Cadogan from AutoExpert.com. You and I get new cars. Cheap. Australia only. Website. Card. Now, let us get straight into it, I think, because so many of you to do, so to speak, so little time. Super Sammy. What happens to your warranty in Australia if someone does basic service work themselves? All you have is receipts from parts stores for oil filters, ect, I think it means etc. Does this get you immediately thrown under the bus? Yeah, Super Sammy, it does. It does because according to the ACCC, although it's kind of anti-competitive for a car brand to require that you get your car serviced at the authorised dealership, they're not allowed to leverage the warranty against you going outside the net. They do kind of require the continuity of your warranty to be based on you getting your car serviced by what the ACCC calls qualified staff. And in practice, that means a qualified mechanic, dude. And the other things that have to happen are you need to get your car serviced on time, which would be the time or the distance, important caveat, whichever comes first. And all of the jobs that are associated with your next particular service need to be done according to the manufacturer's service schedule. And some of the things that seem straightforward with servicing a car, because you might have been doing that since you were, you know, young and on P plates and doing it yourself and oil changes aren't a big deal and things like that. Just think about this for a second. If you've got a modern diesel, right, there will be an oil dilution calibration setting for the engine control ECU, electronic control unit, okay? And what that will do is it'll start the clock with the oil change and then apply a sort of correction factor to the regeneration of the DPF, the diesel particle filter, right? So as time goes on, the engine will assume that there is some level of oil dilution as a result of combustion byproducts getting into it as the car travels certain distances, right? And this will affect the regeneration, like the burn-off of the particles that accumulate in the particle filter. And if you don't reset that, if you just change the oil, you just dump the oil out and put a new filter on and then refill with oil and you think, great, I know what I'm doing here, if you haven't reset the oil dilution calibration clock, then the whole system is not going to operate properly. And then you might do that three or four times or whatever, and the DPF might fail as a result of the engine never restarting its calibration for oil dilution. Now, that's on you in that case, right? And I'd suggest, therefore, that it's really important to get your car serviced by someone who really knows what they're doing. It doesn't have to be the dealer. But if it's not the dealer, then you need to be sure exactly where you're going to stand if you're in a position where some expensive widget on your car has failed and you don't want to be in a position where the manufacturer says, well, that's not a manufacturing defect, that's because you didn't get the car serviced properly, and your service provider doesn't say the exact opposite, which is, it's a manufacturing defect, nothing to do with us, and you're in the middle here watching accountability tennis, and you know, you're the bunny who's not winning, and you've got two parties who are trying to fob you off. So for all these reasons, if you own a new car, you can afford to get it serviced. It's not that expensive. I would do that absolutely on time for the first 10 years at the very least. And then maybe you can make up your own sort of servicing schedule if you want after that. But if you want consumer law protection and you want warranty type protection, then you are going to have to pay for an actual mechanic to do the job, Sammy. Let's move on to Aspie Geek now. 
Hey dude, I have literally just found your channel and I usually watch a channel I have just found for a few minutes before I decide if it's the kind of content I want to watch. Well, sorry to say you have a new subscriber from the land up over. Yep, I'm a dude from the UK with a Christian name. So, we all know what episode he's talking about there. What decided me? Well... That was the way you dealt with the couple of comments from the woke morons. Say it like it is, and be proud, and ball cocks to them. Yeah, thank you. Aspie geek, ball cocks to you too, old son. Toodle pip up in the old dart, God save the king, top of the morning to you, and all of that palaver. Perhaps one day, you know, you and I can discuss the idiocy of the awoke together over a nice warm lager at the Clam and Prong in West Anal Sex. And if you're super lucky, I won't be there. Glendanet now says, Oops, Toyota in trouble for emissions. Yeah. Madden's Lawyers, that was kind of big news a couple of days ago, wasn't it? Madden's Lawyers lining up, hopefully, 500,000 would-be claimants for this uh, class action reaming. Obviously, matter before the court, no intention to prejudice the judgment one way or the other, but it could be a fairly expensive couple of years for Toyota coming up, couldn't it? They've already had their $2.7 billion aggregate damages door opening by the federal court in relation to the way they misrepresented deceptively the functionality or lack thereof of the DPF in the 2.8 diesel engine that was on Hilux, Fortuna and Prado. So there's that. And this could just be a 40 grit watermelon sized enema on top if the court finds for the plaintiff. That could be interesting, couldn't it? So they basically claim that Toyota has done a bit of a Volkswagen with the defeat device thing. So I'll be interested to see what evidence is furnished there and whether or not the court agrees. And I guess this sort of thing will play out over the next several years. And it's obviously big business because class actions are essentially like an informed version of legal gambling where a, a large organisation with deep pockets funds a class action and hopes to get a return on investment. So it seems to me some people who understand this probably better than you and I have reviewed the evidence and decided that from their point of view at least it's a goer on the balance of probabilities. So I guess we'll just have to see what happens there. Now, a dude who is trying very hard not to fit in in the comments, Nigel Stringfellow, is strangely motivated to be helpful to others and he doesn't expect anything for himself like is that any way to comport yourself in the comments Nigel come on dude Nigel says I'm not sure whether this information will be of any value but I thought I would send it anyway the gentleman from Albury recently with the Subaru CVT issue should be having his vehicle serviced at Rex McCartney Motors in Wodonga He's a Subaru specialist, but not as expensive as the dealer, Bacon Motors. I've been taking my Outback to him for years, says Nigel. Last year, he replaced the timing belt for 700 smackers, which was about 400 bucks cheaper than anyone else. Anyway, his number is 605-61197. That number again, 605-61197. If you wanted to pass it on to your viewer, there you go. Job done. Thanks for your continued good work. Regards, Nigel. That, Nigel, Nigel, Nigel. This kind of thing is not going to see you float to the top of the nutfest, is it, mate? You, you're being helpful. You're not expecting anything. I, I'm assuming Nigel Stringfellow is not a pseudonym for Rex McCartney. <laughs> I assume you're just a happy customer, mate. That number again, 605-611-97. So it's always good to hear about good servicing providers wherever doing a good job. And uh, actually, I've corresponded a bit with Nigel and he's uh, an honourable dude as far as I know and I've got no doubt that his Rex McCartney Motors recommendation is absolutely on the money. So if you're in that neck of the woods and you've got a Subaru, that's something to think about. Now, Chris Rabato, he's got a question about, not a question, more of a comment about Nissan's ePower series hybrid system, which I'm very critical of because it seems like 
a ridiculous way to achieve a substandard result to me, like a petrol-powered EV and not a very good one. It's not even as fuel efficient as the completely unremarkable RAV4 hybrid, which, let's face it, the upcoming X-Trail e-power is going to compete against, like 6.1 for the X-Trail versus, I think it's 4.8 or something for the RAV4 hybrid. So if this is an example of efficiency or latest technology, then I'm not seeing it. Anyway, Chris goes, this sounds extremely complex for something that will be used mainly as a grocery getter. It also sounds like a diesel electric submarine in principle, except you're driving the wheels, not propellers. Yeah, well, propellers probably not that helpful for most cars. And this opens the door, doesn't it? It opens the door to the why. Why do we design machines in particular ways? What's the underlying purpose? And I'd suggest that it makes sense for a combustion engine to drive a generator to charge batteries in a submarine because the engine's not going to be so good when the submarine is submerged. And even if you open the window down there to let more air in, it's just going to kill everyone when water floods in past the fly screens, dude. So it makes sense to come up to some sort of high level you know, almost almost not submerged and stick a snorkel up and power up the diesel engine and charge up the batteries. And when you get to a sufficient state of charge, you can shut down the diesel, close the hatch, submerge, do what you're getting paid to do, like launch torpedoes at, I don't know, the enemy. And then when the batteries get to some depleted state and it's operationally feasible, you come back to the surface and crank up the diesel and charge them back up again. So obviously you don't need to worry about that if you're Red Friggin' October or the Kursk or some other nuclear submarine, but for your basic diesel electric submarine, it makes pretty good sense. In fact, if you've ever seen the XPT train running around in New South Wales, the engine in that was uh, repurposed out of a submarine, as I understand it. Right, so Greg McCall now on this same topic goes, I understand your reasoning, and while I tend to agree because of physics, I think it might depend on the efficiency of each of the items in the end-to-end -end chain. He means the generator, the inverter, the traction motors, the uh, battery charging system, etc. Well, I think it might depend on the actual fuel economy because that would give you some indication as to the underlying efficiency of the whole thing. And it's not very efficient, okay? It's also 250-ish kilos heavier than the combustion-only X-Trail, which... If you were conscious for even half of school, you would know that this is not the way to approach efficiency by making something stupendously heavier off the bat. You're nobbling yourself before you get out of the blocks with R&D, aren't you? Anyway, Greg goes on and says, I only say this because of how I think a diesel electric locomotive train works. I thought it had a diesel engine tuned to just efficiently run a generator and then powering electric traction motors to drive the wheels. Now, they move a lot of weight, and I assume they are engineered and have a good engineering reason for this design. Yes, Greg, they do. Actually, I was a cadet engineer in the railways in the 80s and 90s for about six or seven years or something, and uh, I worked on locomotive engines and in factories where they pulled them apart and... Uh, testing them in the field and it's pretty impressive when you walk through the engine bay of a locomotive when it's running like it's one of those moving experiences I guess you'd have to say so anyway the reason they make them that way there's a why okay and the why does not translate to cars the why is you've got 12 wheels on six axles that all need to contribute motive power to dragging whatever it is that you're dragging uphill with your locomotive. And because the mu of, the, like the coefficient of friction of the wheel on the rail is so low, it's only 0.2-ish for steel on steel, you need a lot of drive wheels, okay, to get the tractive effort that you need. You can't just have rear wheel drive like in a car. And can you imagine the complexity of a mechanical drive system that you stuck up the arse of a V16 diesel engine developing 2,000 horsepower and it had to split the drive 
six different ways to six different axles or split it twice, once to the front bogey and once to the rear bogey and then have a gear drive system for all three axles on that bogey. I'd suggest that a drive system such as that would be hideously expensive and it would have a significant maintenance requirement. You'd need to check oil levels and wear and things of that nature all the time and for all these reasons that's why you don't have a car-like drive system coming out of the arse of a locomotive diesel engine because it would just be too complex meaning too expensive and too hard to maintain okay the reason they do the diesel electric drivetrain for a locomotive is because it's easy to drive a single generator and then split the power up to six different traction motors and you've already got physical space for the traction motors because there's an axle there between the two wheels. It's the perfect location for a traction motor. The other thing about locomotives is they don't have batteries, so they're not hybrids, although they do regeneratively break. When you're in overrun, like you go over a crest and you start, the train starts going down a hill, to prevent it just gathering momentum endlessly, the driver can enter regen mode, the traction motors turn into generators. They generate electricity, which is bled off as waste heat in banks of resistors in the roof, which are convective cool through fans and they just lose the heat to the air so you can never get access to that energy again as you do in a car that's a hybrid because that energy goes into a battery to be used later to get you going and railway operators really don't care about fuel efficiency and as to this other claim of Greg's about they just run efficiently these engines to provide electricity then that's not how a locomotive works at all like, if you're going along the flat in a locomotive and there's a gradient coming up that you must climb, then the driver throttles the engine up and it produces more electricity, which gives you more tractive effort at the wheels. And then likewise, as you come over a crest and start going downhill, you throttle back because there's no storage system of a battery to help you provide tractive effort when you need. If you need more tractive effort, it's only coming from one place. That would be the diesel engine, and it must be throttled up to do that. Now let's talk Fred Nurks. What a quintessentially Australian fake name. Mr. Nurks says, can someone explain why you would spend a significant extra for this vehicle? He's still talking about the e-power hybrid here. Six litres per 100 kilometres against a petrol only eight litres per 100 kilometres. And the petrol engine is running most of the time. Dog's dick. It's just a petrol electric locomotive compared to a diesel electric locomotive. Yeah, but no battery and etc. as discussed, dude. But I agree with you about your core point, right? It's $4,200 for this absurd hybrid system, the e-power hybrid system, that's the premium you pay, it adds 200 and I think it's 30, but it's nearly a quarter of a ton more weight to the car, and you'll save two litres for every 100 kilometres, which is about four bucks every time you drive 100 kilometres, and that means in order to break even, <laughs> to, to get your 4,000 bucks back at four dollars per 100 kilometres, you only have to drive 100 thousand kilometers which would be two and a half laps of the planet which to me hardly seems worth it now, there is a little bit more performance out of the e-power system it is the most powerful x-trail you could buy and spending four thousand two hundred bucks for a bit more power yeah okay at times i get that but doing it for fuel economy or efficiency or any of these reasons that's just at odds with the facts basically. And now this from Utilitorian, who is sort of practically astrological in an odd way. That Nissan with its locomotive style drivetrain must have some significant losses over a conventional transmission. One wonders if the variable compression ratio engine made it to a decent dual clutch setup would surpass their complex system in fuel efficiency. As you say, all that weight and complexity has to compromise fuel efficiency seems like a large load of marketing wank. I'd suggest absolutely on the money there, dude, because if you didn't have the electrical part of that equation in the vehicle, your vehicle would be 230 kilograms lighter, which is a huge boon for efficiency anyway. And when you look at all the processes to get from the arse end of the crankshaft to 
electricity at the wheels to drive the thing forward. There's a lot of processes and each one of those requires a loss of available energy because second law of thermodynamics. And it's not that fuel efficient, like compare it to the RAV4 hybrid. It's just not. So why are they doing it? And the reason is it's a tiny engine. It's a three cylinder, one and a half liters. It makes 116 peak kilowatts which by the time you lose energy, getting it to the wheels is probably about 100 kilowatts. And the total system output is 157. So if you're doing that, you're getting about 100 kilowatts from the internal combustion engine, and you must be deriving the balance of about 60 kilowatts from the battery. And the battery is only two kilowatt hours, right? So that battery, if it's providing 60 kilowatts to the wheels, is operating at a massive rate of discharge of something like 30C, which is just insane. And it can only do that for a limited time because it's only it's providing 60 kilowatts and it's only a nearly two kilowatt hour battery. So it can only do that for about two minutes flat out. And I know you generally don't need peak power for two minutes to do anything. But if you're driving in let's call it a spirited way, it would be easy to enter a condition where you needed peak power with the battery already in a fairly depleted state, which would make the provision of the full power delivery, 157 kilowatts, pretty iffy, okay? And that's completely unlike a 157 kilowatt petrol engine because that'll deliver 157 kilowatts all day long. So I'd suggest that there are quite the number of limitations on this e-power system and some of the claims made by Nissan really, they should hang their head in shame, I think, because talking in the context of getting all the benefits of an EV, all the experience of an EV, but with petrol power, that's absurd. It, and it does, just doesn't stand up to reason. Now, let us change tack and get on our blue singlets and go all-wheel driving now in the boonies. David Tansley, with a really salient point, he says, this is so opportune, it's not funny. My wife showed me a post two days ago of a tow hitch that failed through the square hollow section while being the attachment point for a snatch strap. It... The tow ball, the 20 millimeter thick, the thick bent bit of plate and half of the RHS flew back, went through the windscreen of the stuck vehicle and killed the occupants. Not a fun day four wheel driving there, I'm tipping. So the tow ball didn't break, the wheel didn't break, the plate didn't break, the 50 by 50 by four millimeter section of square tube that goes into the receiver broke. And I'd suggest that if that is the case, then the most likely site for the breakage is where the shear pin goes through that holds the hitch in the receiver because that's where the cross-sectional area of the square hollow section is compromised. I did a few quick calculations on the back of this and let's call it 700 square millimetres once you account for the shear pin and the loss of material there the cross-sectional area, 700 square millimetres, and let's assume that the square hollow section tube is made out of your usual cheese-grade low-carbon steel, which would yield at 250 MPa minimum. And uh, there you go. Jumpsuit Ben, you're live on YouTube. Isn't that a lot of fun? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now, is this something that you can talk to me publicly about or am I calling you back? Just about to send you through the in-stock list with a lot of cars. Yeah, right. Hundreds, I assume. Hundreds. Record amounts. Okay, so these are cars that are in stock now. That is correct. All available within the next two months. Right, so maybe I should do an EDM about that forthwith. 669 very, very good cars. Don't tease me, baby. So if you've actually... If you've actually just written your car off or something like that, then these cars are reasonably accessible, yeah? That is correct. Okay. Well, mate, I will promote that to the extent that uh, you haven't already to everyone watching right now. And uh, I'll leave you to it because i got important shit stirring to do. Of course you do. Have a good day. No worries, Jumpsuit Ben. Right. See you soon. There you go. It's funny, isn't it, the way things happen? Where were we? Okay, so this square hollow section, it's like... 
50 by 50 by 4 millimetres. You take the shear pin out of it, that's 700 square millimetres of area. If it's cheese grade mild steel with a yield strength of about 250 MPA, then to break it, you're going to need about 28 tonnes because the breaking, ten, the breaking tensile strength will be about 400, I guess. Uh, MPA. If you're confused about MPA, it stands for megapascals, which is essentially newtons per square millimetre. And a newton, if you're not a physics dude, it's about 100 grams worth of force. Okay, so 10 newtons is about a kilogram. Is That's how, that's the easiest I can make it for. If you're always working in megapascals, though, you use newtons and square millimetres, and it always works out just fine. So to break it, you need about 28 tonnes of load on that hitch if it's in good condition. And to make it yield, like to bend permanently, it needs 17 and a half tonnes. So I'm really not seeing pure tension doing that. What I can assume is that the hitch failed in some way because it was already gonna fail, like it had been damaged or work hardened and been fatiguing and cracking and things of that nature, or else it was also subjected to some other forces like bending or torsion, which would add to the stress and then one area can fail, a crack can develop and then, you know, dogs and cats living together, which is obviously what happened. And for this reason, I'd have to say that if you are that blue singlet dude and you are out there having fun at the weekend, it really is a nice idea if everyone gets home intact. It really is, okay? So I'd be using the snatch strap as an absolute last resort. And if anyone gets stuck, I'd be getting out the shovel and doing a bit of road building or the max tracks or the jack, and I'd be jacking the car up and shoving some rubble under those wheels that have caused the, that have sunk so far that the chassis is now sitting on the deck kind of thing. And I'd try and get out of it that way. And if that didn't work, I would use an inextensible strap or a jag, a drag chain because those things don't hold energy right you can just use the tractive effort of a mobile vehicle to recover a stuck vehicle using tension but not stretch okay that would be a tractive effort recovery which is different to a snatch strap which does stretch and it's the energy in the stretch that is so dangerous and yet it doesn't feel bad at all it feels quite gentle right because it's like driving at 100 k's an hour. That feels quite gentle too. In fact, if you do it for eight hours, you can feel like you could get out and walk faster, although you have acquired a shit ton of energy and that energy, if it comes unglued, will really damage you. You can't feel energy is what I'm saying, but when you've got systems, if you're close to a system that has acquired a ton of energy, then you are inherently at risk. And four-wheel drive recovery with snatch straps is just like that. And for all these reasons... I would be using a snatch trap as an absolute last resort, not as the first weapon of choice to deploy against a particular time when a vehicle gets stranded. The problem being, if the strap remains intact and something fails, then a projectile weighing a significant amount will be attached to the strap, which will then have no alternative but to impart all of the elastic strain energy in the strap into kinetic energy of the projectile and because of Newton's second law it's going to be headed straight for the vehicle that didn't have anything break off and that is just so flat out dangerous it's compounded by the fact that people do snatch vehicles out over enthusiastically when they should absolutely not and they don't put ballistic arresting devices at each end of the strap or some sort of blanket or weight in the middle of the strap to try and arrest the projectile before it gets to the victim. Anyway, that's my rant over, but thanks for highlighting that, David. I like to bring that up every now and then with the kinetic recovery devices because they are so dangerous and they're sold to you in a manner that suggests they are simplicity itself to use and also reasonably consequence-free devices, which they are 999 times out of a 1,000 or something. But if you're using one on that critical one occasion, then all bets are off and it's really bad for someone. Anyway, that's a bit of a serious way to end this one. I am happy to engage in these kinds of chats that raise worthwhile points that you guys bring up in the comments because otherwise it's just me sort of preaching down here from a pulpit and I like it better when it's more of a bilateral exchange. I'm funny like that. <laughs>